Okay, this is going to be Matthew chapter 4. And I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ, the champion. Why is Jesus Christ the champion? A lot of people don't realize how much of a tough character the Lord Jesus Christ is. So let's just get right into it. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus Christ is the champion. Number one, because his foes are fallen. Everyone that tries to go up against Jesus Christ is fallen. And they're going to fall if they haven't yet. It says in Matthew 4, 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So Jesus was led up of the Spirit. And if you're going to be like Jesus, then you're going to have to be led of the Spirit. If you're going to be led in the Spirit, you're not letting the flesh lead. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ was led up of the Spirit. And before he officially starts his earthly ministry, you will see the testing of the king. Uh, Jesus didn't want to just claim to be God. He wanted to prove it. He proves he's the champion by defeating the champion. Just like David, who is a type of Jesus Christ, defeats Goliath, you know, the giant, who is also a champion. In 1 Samuel 17, 4, 1 Samuel 17, 23, and 1 Samuel 17, 51, Goliath is called a champion. But David comes in, David beat the champ in his first fight, just like Jesus Christ defeats the reigning champ in his first recorded fight before he starts his earthly ministry. There's a saying that goes, if you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. And Jesus Christ proves he's the best by always defeating the most powerful being in the world, in the universe. Outside of himself, the devil is the most powerful. And we're no match for God. We're no match for the devil. But the devil's no match for God. It says in Matthew 4, 1, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the devil's just going to be one of those foes that are fallen that come up against the Lord Jesus Christ. And the devil is Satan. It shows us that in Matthew 4, 10 through 11, calling calling him devil one minute, calling him Satan the other minute. And notice how the Bible just explains itself all the time. It says in Revelation 20 and verse 2, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Right there showing you the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan's the same guy. It lets you know the devil's the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, Satan. And Matthew 4, 2 calls him the tempter. But imagine seeing Jesus Christ on one end of the ring and the devil on the other side. Imagine hearing the announcer look over at the Lord Jesus Christ and the light is so bright that it's blinding and he says, in this corner you have the son of David, the son of Abraham, the man Christ Jesus, the chiefest among 10,000, God manifested in the flesh, the avenger, the punisher, the savior, the son of God, the lamb of God, the word made flesh, he which is, which was, and which is to come, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the almighty, the rose of Sharon, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure he would have a great introduction like that. And then the announcer would look over to the other corner where it's dark, and it's gloomy, and say, in this corner we have Lucifer, the hast been, which is, which is to be tormented, the tempter, the dragon, the accuser of the brethren, the crooked serpent, that old serpent, the prince of the power of the air, Beelzebub, Lord of the flies, which is the devil and Satan. And then the bell would ring. The fight starts. But what do we see? Jesus, he's led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Jesus went into the wilderness. Jesus and John were both wilderness preachers. And this shows it isn't a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted, but he's not going to sin. He never sinned. The devil's going to tempt him here in this fight. 
but he's not going to sin. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus faced every temptation that you would face and came out smelling like the Rose of Sharon. He came out as sinless as a, save, a person that could save the entire world. He's the only person that could go to the cross and his sacrifice be good enough to save the entire world. Anybody else that went to the cross, they couldn't save anybody because they're a sinner just like everybody else. But there's something different about the man Christ Jesus and that is that he is the sinless son of God. Mark 1.12 says, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. That's the that's the other version of this story. You know, the Gospels, they got the same stories with some different details. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Jesus Christ always had the Spirit in the driver's seat. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered unto him. So he wasn't out there without a threat. He had wild beasts with him out there. And, and this wasn't the pansy Jesus that Hollywood pictures. He was out there 40 days with the wild beasts tempted of Satan. Mark seems to show that the temptation from the devil wasn't just after the 40 days of fasting, but during the 40 days. And he was in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan. And Luke 4.1 and 4.2 seems to show the same thing where it says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led up, or was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. So it seems that it was the entire 40 days he was tempted. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. So he ate nothing. The Word was made flesh and showed you how to beat the flesh. He was hungry. He hadn't ate anything. And another opponent the Lord put down was the flesh itself. He was full of the Holy Ghost. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. He had hunger. He had thirst. He had fatigue in the flesh. But Jesus always got the best of it. He always beat the flesh. That's just another one of those foes that are fallen. In Matthew 4, 2, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, this is the devil's first shot, his first swing at the Savior. The fight's begun. When the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Well, Jesus Christ is the stone. He's the stone cut without hands, Daniel 2.34. He's the bread, John 6.35. He's the bread of life. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. Any kind of temptation you face, the Lord had to face it and defeat it. He came out as the undefeated champion. But it says in 1 John 2.16, it's going to show us our temptations. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The devil trying to get Jesus to command that these stones be made bread is nothing more than the lust of the flesh. He's trying to give get the get the Lord to give in to the flesh. You see, Jesus Christ was in the flesh and he was hungry. It wasn't wrong for Jesus to turn the stone into bread. It would have been wrong for him to listen to the devil. That's why it would have been wrong. But this temptation matches the one the serpent put on Eve in Genesis 3, 6 when she saw that the tree was good for food she looked at the tree she saw it was good for food and jesus wasn't worried about the stones he's the stone of stumbling and rock of offense he wasn't worried about any bread he's the bread of life he was perfectly content with just himself like he had been in eternity past before he even formed the crooked serpent the serpent's no match for the savior it says in matthew 4 4 but he answered and said this is the Lord answering, and he's throwing a punch back and says, It is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the Lord responds with Scripture. He uses the weapon that he wants you to use. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning they're not fleshy. They're not of this world. It's not something that's worldly. It's a spiritual thing. It says, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Notice it says, casting down every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. What did the devil do? He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High, he says back there in Isaiah 14. So the Lord used the greatest weapon of spiritual warfare and casted down the high thing, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself. That's what the devil is. He's a high thing that exalts himself. And the Lord used the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal to cast him down. And that's nothing but the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see, the devil is that high thing that exalts himself. He puts himself up there pretty high. And that's why he's about to take the Lord to a high place on a pinnacle of the temple. That is why he is referred to as spiritual wickedness in high places. In Matthew 4.4, 4, it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So the Lord answered. He is our example and it says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. How does Jesus answer? Jesus was just quoting scripture. Deuteronomy 8.3, That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live he said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word job twenty three twelve, it says neither have i gone back from the commandment of his lips i have, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food man shall not live by bread alone but by every word so the lord jesus christ used the phrase it is written he puts the words up very high these words were written by the Lord himself. The Lord did a lot of writing. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This whole Bible was written by the Lord. Not just the words that are in red. The Lord did a lot of writing to man throughout history. Exodus twenty four twelve. He said, I will give thee tables of stone and the law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Exodus thirty one eighteen, and he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Those things were written with the finger of God. In Joshua 1, 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So it was written by God himself, the words were. And that's what was proceeding out of the Lord's mouth. What he himself had written, he was using to slay the devil. So the sword proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord and put the devil against the ropes. And the devil tries to throw another punch. But what happens? Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Like I said, he likes to hang around high places. He's putting him up there on the pinnacle of the temple. 
The devil is now going to tempt the Lord again. And this time the temptation will be about the pride of life. It says in 1 John 2, 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So this will match the temptation the devil presented to Eve when she saw a tree to be desired to make one wise. This temptation was about the pride of life. And the devil says to him in 4, 6, And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So the devil says, If thou be the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God. You see, a temptation would be to show the devil that he is God and just float right off the temple. The Lord just doesn't have to prove anything to the devil, though. He just quotes scripture again. In Matthew 4, 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In Deuteronomy six sixteen, it says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. So you see, the Lord himself is telling the devil that I'm God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He's telling the devil, don't tempt me. I'm God. You can't tempt me. You can't just come in here and do this. Notice the devil quoted scripture as well in Matthew 4, 6. And saith unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, notice the devil says, for it is written. He should give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. The devil is quoting Psalm 91, 11 through 12. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. The devil left out the part about, to keep thee in all thy ways. So the angels were already with the Lord keeping him in all his ways. He didn't have to jump to prove it. This one guy told me one time that every time he gets on a high balcony or drop off somewhere that something tells him to jump. Well, guess who tells him that? You see, remember the devil is called your adversary. Just because he can't be everywhere at once doesn't mean he doesn't get around. So if there's something telling you to jump off of a high building or a high place or a balcony. Well, we know from the Bible who said it to Jesus. The devil says, cast thyself down. He took him on a high place and said, cast thyself down. That's unclean spirits of the devil telling you to do that. It says in Matthew 4, 7, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus quickly throws the devil back on the mat with another verse of scripture. You see, Jesus knows he has to be tempted in all points like as we are, so he lets him get back up again. He lets him back up. He is just making a show of him openly triumphing over him. It's just like when, you know, you get a some guy in, a, in the ring that can't really fight all that good to fight the the greatest fighter of all time. The greatest fighter of all time has to put on a show he has to make a show of it and in matthew 4 8 it says again so here comes the devil again he's he's the lord lets him back up and he's gonna try another shot at the savior the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them so he's taking him up into a high mountain because the devils love high places he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And Luke explains how quickly the devil does it. In Luke 4, 5, it says, And the devil, taketh, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Matthew 4, 9 says, And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil's pathetic attempt at a comeback victory is a complete failure. He's offering all the kingdoms to the Lord. 
why would Jesus fall down and worship him to get the kingdoms if he knows he's already going to get them anyway? Another pathetic attempt here. In Revelation 11, 15, the, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The devil offering these kingdoms was the temptation of the lust of the eyes. He took him up there and showed him all these great things that he could have, all the kingdoms he could have. 1 John 2.16 shows us all the temptations we're going to have for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. The devil showed him all these things in a moment of time. This matches the devil tempting Eve because she saw that the tree was pleasant to the sight in Genesis 3.6. Matthew 4, 9, And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. I, be I believe the devil would have given them to the Lord if he agreed to the deal. But he can't make the Savior fall down. Satan can could give him fame and power, authority and fortunes in exchange for worship. Because in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, In whom the God of this world, it shows us that the devil is the God of this world, He's got the power to give out the kingdoms. And if you want temporary pleasure that only lasts for a little while, then choose the devil. But if you want eternal riches, then you choose the Lord. In Matthew 4.10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So the Lord tells the devil, Get thee hence. Just like you would a stray dog that came into your yard. That's how much the devil's worth to him. Once again, the Lord quotes scripture. Exodus thirty four fourteen. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. And in Matthew four eleven, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So the angels came and ministered unto the Lord anyway. He didn't have to jump off the pinnacle of the temple to get the angels to come. They came anyway. You know, they weren't teaching the Lord anything. Just because the angels came and ministered unto him, they're not teaching the Lord anything. They're just giving him glory. Telling him that they're they're glad he defeated the devil, just like they knew he would, and giving him praise and proclaiming that he is God in the flesh. But see, the devil leaveth him. Then the devil leaveth him. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil in this fight leaves the arena with his red, long red tail between his legs. And yes, he has a red tail in Revelation 12, 3 through 4. It's red, and he has a tail, and he is a dragon. The reigning champ now has a big, fat L on his record, a loss. You know, he defeated Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Job. He defeated all those guys at one point or another. But he can't beat the Savior. And imagine the angels gathering around the Savior. Just like the fans would the winner of a fight. And pro proclaiming that he is God manifested in the flesh. Jesus is the reigning champ. The undefeated, undisputed champion. Every foe that comes against him has fallen because he's the champion. See, the, the devil offering him them king, the kingdoms of the world, he's trying to get Jesus to take the kingdoms before he's supposed to get them. You see, uh, he would he would be if he went ahead and took the kingdoms, he would be bypassing the cross. You see that? That would show you, if he did that, that would mean that he didn't love us. But he didn't bypass the cross. He... He turned the devil down. He turned the kingdoms down. He knew he had to go to the cross. And he knew he would get the kingdoms later. But see, the devil is pretty slick in that way. He was going to give him the kingdoms, show him a way that he could have the kingdoms by bypassing the cross. But Jesus Christ is the champion because his foes are fallen. And the next reason is because he fulfilled the facts. You see, the scripture is the truth. Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And 
He, he fulfilled the facts of the scripture. Everything in the scripture is a fact. Everything in the scripture is going to come to pass. Everything that needed to be fulfilled at his first com coming was accomplished by the Lord. It says in Matthew 4.12, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Notice it doesn't stop the Lord from preaching and doing what he's doing. It probably just made it more bolder to see John being cast into prison. It says in Philippians 1.14, And many of the brethren in the Lord, this is Paul speaking, many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, by the fact that he's chained up in prison, he says, waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You see, persecution actually makes people stronger and tougher and braver and bolder and more confident. And it it doesn't always just see them. It makes them more confident. And Joseph, John, Jesus, Paul, Silas, Peter, and all kinds of great men are arrested in the Bible. And the Bible says all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Matthew 4, 13 says, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So Isaiah the prophet is Isaiah the prophet. And notice how precise and amazing the scriptures are. They even the, record the Lord's change of residence. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast and the borders of Zebulun of Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled. So even the Lord's change of residence is was prophesied and fulfilled. When, when Jesus Christ came, he fulfilled the facts. Such a detail proves the Bible has to be right. How could one man fulfill all these prophecies in one lifetime? You see, a champion fighter has many men predicting that he's going to take home the victory. And a true champion doesn't disappoint. Jesus Christ had all these prophecies to fulfill, and he came through on every single one. If you were a betting man, and you had the Bible back then, and you lived during Jesus' earthly ministry, you could go and bet money that he's going to fulfill all these scriptures, and you'd be the richest man in the world. It would be like if you got some type of sports magazine that told you every single winner of the Super Bowl, the NBA Finals, the World Series for the next 50 years, and you go and bet on all those games, which I'm not for that, but if you, you could go and bet on all those games, you can get it right every time. Jesus Christ fulfilled the scriptures he fulfilled the facts every single time. And here are just some of the prophecies fulfilled at his first coming. If somebody tells you that the Bible's not right, that the Bible's not the word of God, show them this right here. Here are just a few of the prophecies Jesus fulfilled at his first coming. Genesis 3.15, Jesus the promised seed. He was the promised seed. Numbers 24.17, Genesis 12.3, Genesis 17.19, he comes through Abraham. Isaiah 9.6, it says, Unto us a son is given, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Samuel 7, 8 through 12, you got a prophecy on his birth. Numbers 24.17, comes from Israel. Isaiah 11.1, 1, he comes out of David. Uh, Isaiah 7.14, born of a virgin. The virgin birth prophesied in the Old Testament. What are the chances of the Lord fulfilling that unless he is Lord? Isaiah 7.14 called Emmanuel, even his name. Micah 5.10, born in Bethlehem, the place of his birth prophesied. Jeremiah 31.5, 
There's a massacre of children that happens at his birthplace. What are the chances of that happening? You got, he's born of a virgin, what they call him, where he's born, and what's taking place around him at his birthplace when he's born. In Deuteronomy 18, 15, he would be a prophet. Isaiah 60 and verse 3, wise men come to him. Psalm 34, 13, he has no guile. Genesis 49, 10, he's from the tribe of Judah. They even get It even gets the tribe right. In Daniel 9, 25, you have the exact date of his birth given. That's how the wise men knew to, to, to when to come. What are the chances? The exact date of his birth is given. So a, a, a man is born of a virgin called Emmanuel in the right family line the son of Abraham Isaac, Jacob, David on the exact date that it said the Messiah would be born and what happens a voice cries to prepare his way John the Baptist comes, that's prophesied Isaiah 40 and verse 3 Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 Prophesies how he's God in the flesh. Shows you that. I, Hosea 11, 1 shows that he would spend time in Egypt, which he did. Zechariah 9, 9, he enters Jerusalem on the foal of an ass. Psalm 69, 4, he's hated without a cause. Psalm 41, 9, and Zechariah 11, 12 through 13, he's betrayed by a friend, Judas. Zechariah 13, 7, prophesies about the disciples leaving him. Psalm 38, 11, friends and family leave him. Psalm 109 and verse 2, he lie, there's lies set against him. Zechariah 11, 12, he's sold for 30 pieces of silver. What are the chances of that? And this is not, this doesn't even include all the types and pictures of the Lord Jesus that are in the Old Testament. Psalm 35, 11, false witnesses stand up against him. Isaiah 53, 4, he bears the sins of the world. Isaiah 50 and verse 6, they spit on him and pull out his beard. Isaiah 50 and verse 6, he gives his back to the smiters. Psalm 69, 21, he's given gall and vinegar to drink. Psalm 22, 1, my God, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, there's prophecies about the cross in the Old Testament. And Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. In Psalm 22, 18, they cast lots for his garment. Micah 5, 1, he's smitten on the cheek. Isaiah 53, 9 through 12, he's, it shows us that he's numbered with the transgressors. He's put between the two thieves. And Job 16, 10, it shows he's going to be hit in the face. Job 30, 22, it shows him being lifted up on the cross. And Job 30, 28, the sun refuses to shine. That it. That's when the sun refused to shine from the sixth to the ninth hour when he's on the cross. And Job 30, 29 talks about how, how he pays the price in hell. I don't believe he went and burned in hell for those three days and three nights. I believe hell, the devil brought hell to him while he was on the cross. And he said, I thirst while he was on the cross. I believe he took our hell during that time. In Psalm twenty two sixteen, 16, he got nails and hands and feet. Psalm 34, 20, none of his bones were broken. Zechariah 12, 10, they pierced him. Zechariah 13, 6, wounds in his hands. Psalm 109, 4, praise for his enemies. Remember, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Psalm 31, 5, he says, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Isaiah 53, 9, buried with the rich. Psalm 16, 10, you got a prophecy of the resurrection. Psalm 24, 7 through 10, a prophecy of him ascending into heaven. Psalm 110, 1, a prophecy of him sitting at the right hand of God. So there's just 48 prophecies fulfilled at his first coming. That's not to mention all the pictures and types from the Old Testament that you have prophesying about him. And that's not to mention all the prophecies of his second coming. You see, how would an ordinary man fulfill all these troops in the scriptures in one lifetime perfectly.
Jesus Christ is champion because his foes are fallen and he fulfilled the facts. He has to be God. Matthew 4.16, The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. This is quoting the prophecy from Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. You see, you're in the dark. The people which sat in darkness. You're in the dark until you meet Jesus Christ. In John 3, 19, it says, And this is a condemnation that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Col Colossians 1, 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You see, Jesus Christ is light. The devil tried to knock his light out, but the Lord will knock your dark out. The only time darkness falls around the Lord is when he punches it. Darkness don't fall around him any other time. And when he took the sin and darkness of man on him at the cross to defeat it once and for all, it, it came on him then. But any other time, darkness only falls around him when he throws a punch at it before you were saved you had the shadow of death hovering over you like a giant death cloud like an alien mothership covering a city and turning it dark that's what the shadow of death was on you and some people say the shadow of death and the tribulation is going to be some giant iron death cloud thing death machine thing but the wrath of God was abiding on you before you were saved, and you were a dead man walking. But then you got saved, and Jesus Christ sprung up in you. Now you got the light of the world in you. And then it says in Matthew 4, 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now Jesus begins his earthly ministry, being about 30, and he was preaching the kingdom of heaven. This is about a coming physical kingdom where he would be the king on the throne and reigning from Jerusalem. So he, we know that he's God. We know he's the savior. We know he's the champion because his foes are fallen. He fulfilled the facts. And the next thing is his followers are fishermen. His followers are fishermen. Jesus Christ is a champion. And you can tell by his followers what type of men Look up to a champion, a champion fighter. Hairdresser men are manly men men. And I'm not bashing you if you're a hairdresser man. It's just, it just came to my mind. I don't know why I said it. But the men who followed Jesus Christ were rough, manly men. Matthew 4.18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers you see these were rough fishermen that worked with their hands and that is the followers that jesus christ wants and i mean i got more respect for a, a hairdresser man than these men that won't even provide for their family but sit around and play video games the 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 effeminate hairdresser guy is more masculine than a guy that sits around and will not even provide for his family. Jesus wanted rough fishermen that work with their hands to work for him. It says in Ephesians 4.28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands. Jesus wants workers. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands. As we commanded you, these men that Jesus gets to be his followers, they work with their hands. And Matthew 4, 19, and saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus knew the best workers for him would be men that were already working. He knew they were already catching fish, and they could easily transition into catching men, being fishers of men. You see, soul winners, people that go out and give the gospel and get people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are fishers of men because we are underwater. You never thought about this, have you? But it says in Psalm eighteen sixteen, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. And Psalm one forty eight four, praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens, plural. So that shows you that there is a body of water above the first and second heaven. 
you see the first heavens where the birds fly. The second heaven is where you see the stars and the moon and stuff. So there's a body of water above that. You say, well, that's crazy. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, that's just hippie stuff you're believing. Really? Well, what about the sea of glass where God's throne sits that it talks about in Revelation 15? There's a sea of glass up there. So when God uses a man to win a soul, the Lord looks down through that sea of glass like he's ice fishing or something and sees you take the bait. He sees you biting. He's calling out fishers of men, you see. Matthew 4, 20, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. They straightway, like immediately, left their nets. You see, the church of Ephesus is rebuked because they left their first love, the Lord and his word. But be like the disciples and leave your first love according to the flesh. They left their nets and followed him. They left their nets. You couldn't get a lot of men to lay down the remote, the video game controller, the fishing rod. You couldn't get them to leave those things. You follow Jesus today when you follow his word. 1 Peter 2.21 says to follow his steps. The word is the Lord's mind. We need to especially follow what Paul wrote to the church. Paul said, be ye followers of me in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, even as I also am of Christ. You follow the Lord by following his word. Matthew 4.21, and going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. So these two were such roughnecks that he named them the sons of thunder. And Mark 3.17, and James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James, he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. John is called, also called the disciple whom Jesus loved. You see, the Lord trusted him with the care of his mother after he died on the cross. Would Jesus trust you with his mother? That's that's some a lot of trust he's, he's putting in him there. In John 19, 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples, the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. So he gave John the watch and care over his mother when he died on the cross. In Matthew 4.22, says, And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. So these were men that could be under the authority of their father. I'm sure Jesus looked at that as well. They were under the authority of their father on their job. And Ephesians 6.2 says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. These were men who were workers that were honoring their father and their mother, and it doesn't seem that they even looked back. It says in Luke 9, 62, And Jesus saith unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Just like David had mighty men that followed him, the Lord had rough, rough fishermen that followed him. Why would Peter, James, and John follow a weak, effeminate man like the movies portray Jesus to be? That's not what they followed. They're following a manly man, God in the flesh. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ, the champion, his foes are fallen. He fulfilled the facts. His followers are fishermen. And the next thing, his fame spreads far. He's a champion. His fame's going to spread far. Jesus Christ is a champion, and his fame spread far. And I would say that he was on every magazine cover, or would have been, but the world hated him. Watch out for a preacher who is placed in a good light on late-night talk shows and magazine covers. It says in 1 John 3.13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. The world hated him, but he still had people that loved him. The people who hated him couldn't stop talking about him, the people that loved him wanted to meet him and get close to him and worship him. There's people that hated him, but there's people that loved him. His fame spread far. It says in Matthew 4, 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. 
The Lord made a name for himself going around teaching and preaching. Sometimes a great fighter or champion can keep people amazed just by the things that he says when he's not even in the ring. Jesus could lay a man down flat just with his words. In John 18, 4, it says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto him, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Just the words coming out of his mouth could leave people on their backs. Men were astonished at his words. In Matthew seven twenty eight and 29, it says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He had authoritative words when he taught and when he preached, and he confirmed these words with the sign gifts. He could heal any sickness or disease. He could do any sign or miracle. In Matthew 4.23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, and all manner of disease among the people. See, this was to confirm the word, all these miracles he was doing. And they went forth and pre in Mark 16.20. It says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews. And he did all the signs and miracles to confirm what he was saying to the Jews. You see, these signs and miracles accompany the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.22, For the Jews require a sign. The gospel of the kingdom was accompanied by signs, and the gospel of the kingdom was about Jesus Christ being king and ruling on the throne in Jerusalem with Israel as head of the nations. That's what he was going around preaching. And signs followed the preaching of this gospel. In Matthew 4.24, his fame spreads far. His fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments. And he healed all their diseases. All those which were possessed with devils. Plenty of times he uh, gets devils out of people. Remember the maniac of Gadara and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. There's nobody he couldn't heal. You couldn't have COVID around Jesus. You could touch his garment and be healed. He didn't have to follow safety guidelines when he healed. He didn't wear a mask when he healed. He didn't social distance. Uh, he got spit and clay on his fingers and rubbed it in a blind man's eye and healed him. People today would have a heart attack if they saw Jesus putting his spit in the man's eyeballs. But in John 9, 6, it said, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He wouldn't find no health at safety guidelines. He, You couldn't have COVID around him. He showed no fear of devils. As the champ, his foes are fallen. Men would bring those who were possessed with devils. And the Lord would get rid of the demons that are devils out of them, the unclean spirits. Matthew 4.24, and his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. You see, the devil may be made without fear. He's Leviathan of Job 41. But the devils tremble. And fear Jesus Christ. They say to him, don't torment us before the time. You see, he had complete power over unclean spirits. Jesus had no fear of them. You fear them. You check under your bed for the boogeyman. But unclean spirits check under their bed for the Lord Jesus Christ. The lunatics would even come to get healed. That was people who were affected with madness that was caused by the moon. You see, no wonder your kids go really go crazy on night there's a full moon. I mean, I was driving the other day, and the kids are going crazy in the back. I look up, it's a moon. I was like, wow, that's, it's true. It's all true. Some people call them moonstruck. If werewolves were real, 
the Lord could have taught them to play dead fetch and bring him his newspaper. He could have went out during a full moon in a werewolf pack and all you're going to hear is yelping. You know, he, would, he could have power over any evil, any sickness, any disease, any problem somebody had. He could heal it. He could solve the problem. And it says in Matthew 4.25, And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. He would have billions of followers on social media today. Well, if they didn't ban him first. People who hate him would follow him to criticize what he says. You would always be seeing on the news, the Lord Jesus Christ said this. The, the liberals on the news would say, well, the Lord Jesus Christ said this, and they'd criticize what he said and twist what he said. People who love him would also follow him because they want to worship him. They know he's the real deal. They know he's the champion. Great multitudes follow the Lord Jesus, whether it's to hate him or whether it's to love him, just like a champion, a champion fighter today. You got all kinds of people that love him. You got all kinds of people that hope he gets knocked out in the first round in his next fight. But Jesus Christ is the champion. Jesus Christ is the champ. His foes are fallen. He fulfills the facts. And all those other things I said, I can't remember off the top of my head. But Jesus Christ, the champ.